Hi, I'm Philip. Uh, I'm from beautiful Vienna. Um, when I'm not at conferences, I'm organizing meetups uh, on databases and academic papers. Uh, and to contrast that, uh, when working, uh, I try to get rid of any paper. So we, at my company, we try to replace all printed papers. But today, let's talk about Nginx. Um, Nginx, yes, it's not called Nginx or whatever, it's called Nginx. Uh, and the images are on purpose. So on the left-hand side, you can maybe not see it that well, but it's a Ferrari engine. And that's also on purpose, because Nginx is very fast. Um, so actually, who uses Apache? Uh, OK, quite a lot. Who uses Nginx? Very well. Uh, who uses Tomcat, Passenger, Chatty, whatever? Uh, OK. Uh, who doesn't know? OK, good. Um, so where did Nginx come from? So there is this nice saying, uh, all the parent sites use it, so it must be decent. Um, uh, it's probably true, but yeah. Um, so for me, uh, the feeling is, so I've been using Apache for a long time, and then I've mi migrated to Nginx. Uh, it has been like from moving from Subversion to Git. When I was using Subversion, I thought, OK, it's OK. It doesn't hurt. It's not that bad. Uh, Maybe there could be something better, but it's OK. Uh, then after I moved to Git, it was this feeling, OK, actually, Subversion did suck. Uh, and it's probably the same for Apache and Nginx. So while you're using Apache, it's pretty much OK. And the configuration file, it's huge. And you don't know what's going on, but it's probably OK. But once you start using Nginx, you, start, you get the feeling that, no, actually, that hasn't been OK. So who's using it, actually? Uh, WordPress, for example, they're WordPress.com. They're using it for an app server and a load balancer. Um, it's prominently used on GitHub for static content, which is currently being DDoSed out of the internet, but it's probably not Eng Nginx faults. Uh, and uh, Wikipedia does SSL termination with it. OK, so those are three very big examples. But how is it the internet in general seeing the issue? Um, I hope you can read that. So for the, for the big sites, Apache is still taking the crown with nearly 60%. But the uh, more users the site has, the fewer people use Apache. So those who don't know what they are doing, they are using Apache. And the ones who do know what they are doing, they are using Nginx, you could say. Um, yeah, we, can, we, we could argue about that. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, a bit of IIS, uh, Lightspeed, Google Server, it's yeah, hardly there. Uh, or if you can see the timeline of a different uh, metric, so this one is from Netcraft. The previous bean has been from w 3 Tex. Uh, so here, Apache is still taking the crown of crown of the I think the million busiest websites, uh, but uh, Nginx is also uh, moving up along. So 50% versus 21 at the moment, but well, it can only improve. So how did it all start? Um, it has been started uh, by a Russian, Igor, and I really don't know how to pronounce his last name, so I won't even try. Uh, it was more than 10 years ago, uh, and he started it for Rambler, which no one, I guess, knows. It's a big Russian search engine and portal, and they had performance issues, so they were looking for something new, and they started Nginx. And it seems to have been working well. Uh, in general, it's been BSD licensed, so it's very open. It's cross-platform C code. Uh, and it's been around a while, so it's pretty stable. We are currently at 1.6, and 1.7 is in the preview. And since a year ago or so, you can even get commercial support from the company behind Nginx, nginx.com now. I think they're based in San Francisco, like everyone. And if you require it, you can get uh, support from them. OK, so how do they describe themselves? Uh, it's a lightweight, event-driven uh, reverse proxy for web and mail services. OK, so what's the main difference to Apache? If you know the Apache model, uh, Apache has threads and is process-oriented. 
So whenever a request comes in for Apache, uh, you spawn a new process uh, for each connection. And spawning a new process for each connection requires about one megabyte of RAM. Which, is, which doesn't sound that much now that we have gigabytes of RAM, uh, but assume you have a few thousand of concurrent users, that's quite a lot of RAM you're actually spending just for keeping up uh, connections. Uh, since 2.4, the latest stable version, there is the multi-process memory uh, mode that reduces RAM usage, but it's still quite a lot because it's still the same approach of you have process and you, and you fork processes and you have one blocking process uh, for connections. Um, so to put this into numbers, uh, if you have 200 kilobytes response, you want to serve your clients. This is probably trivial to fetch from disk and uh, generate. So it's only probably milliseconds to get that response. But assume you have a user on a mobile connection, which only does uh, like 100 kilobits per second, like 20 kilobytes per second. Uh, you need 10 seconds to transmit the 200 kilobyte file. So you need to keep that one connection open for uh, 10 seconds just to serve one request. And I don't know how your pages look like, but due to our designers, our pages have like 30 or 40 uh, requests on each of them. So you have many images, and yes, you have the HTML file, JavaScript files, CSS files, probably web fonts, everything, everything you need to transmit to the client needs one of these connections. So you open up the connection and it stays up until the whole thing has been transmitted. So it's blocking. You have one process that's just serving that data bit by bit over the line uh, to the client. Uh, so if you, have if you have a thousand connections, you have a thousand megabytes uh, blocked for 10 seconds and this is probably not good. Um, so we need something else. Uh, this is saying it's time for web servers to handle 10,000 clients simultaneously. Um, yeah, like at the big football table. Uh, so how did people do that? Uh, they're based on this assumption, there is the so-called C10K challenge, uh, which is really the thing, okay, we want to service uh, 10,000 uh, 10, clients uh, by one server. And Nginx solution for that is we need an event-driven architecture. Event-driven is all the bus now, so what does it mean for Nginx? Um, you have a single non-blocking thread. It's the same like in Node, Redis, all the fancy new things have just one single non-blocking thread. Uh, so you don't need to switch threads, uh, you don't need to allocate memory for new processes. Uh, it's just one thing that doesn't get blocked while sending data to a slow client. It just does its work and then hands off that work uh, while the client is waiting. Uh, the advantage is you have uh, a pretty stable memory uh, usage uh, and no context switches. So it should be much faster. Uh, how does it look in practice? Uh, first, you receive a request. Uh, the request then triggers some event in in your process, the process hands off that event uh, and retrieves only the output once it's been generated and then sends it off again. Uh, that's generally called the reactor pattern, like anything that's reactive uh, is trying to use some model like that. Uh, and how does it look in the architecture? You have a request coming in, you have here your workers, so you would typically start uh, one uh, process per core on your server, depending on how many cores you have, and these can then do their work, and they will communicate with your proxy, uh, with your memcached, with your PHP application in the backend. So the server won't do anything itself. Uh, it will hand off all the, the, the base work. Uh, and if you want to know more about that, there is a very nice book, The Architecture of Open Source Applications. Uh, it's freely available on the internet and it describes many open source uh, applications in detail how they work internally. So that's highly recommended. Uh, it describes Git internally and many other useful things. Okay, so now that we went over the general basics, let's get to the fun part, uh, features. Uh, in German, we have a very nice word, uh, 
the eierlegende Wollmilchsau, which is, if you cannot guess it from the picture, uh, the direct translation would be egg-laying Wollmilchsau. So, because the thing uh, does everything, so it can give you milk, uh, it is a pig for meat, uh, it can give you eggs, uh, and I think that's the sheep, so you have the wool to keep warm. So it does everything. And Engine X uh, basically does everything for you. So let's look at the 101 things uh, Engine X can do for you. Uh, let's start off uh, with something heavy, uh, SSL termination. That's, uh, yeah, let's see in how much detail we will go into that. SSL termination or SSL in general is damn hard. Uh, luckily, the nice guys from Mozilla have uh, a configurator where you only need to define your web server. Then you can define uh, how old are the browsers that need to access my site. Uh, then you can define the server version, the OpenSSL version, and another parameter we will come to that. And then it will spit out the complete configuration for you with all the nitty gritty details uh, you would otherwise need to keep yourself. So please use that. Don't copy uh, some configuration from a blog post from 2011 because it's probably totally unsafe by now uh, due to the freak attack on SSL and all the other vulnerabilities, beast and whatever they are called. Uh, so this will generate your secure configuration for you. Uh, Concerning the browser support, uh, I'm normally choosing intermediate because otherwise you would need Internet Explorer 11 or up. So no 9, 10, which might be a, a little hard on the users. But this will give you a decent configuration. So let's look at the details. How does it look like that? Um, first, you define that your server listens on port 443, uh, the SSL port. Then you give it the, the intermediate certificate. Uh, signed by your root authority, then you need to say, okay, here is my private key, and then you can define a session timeout uh, and a session cache. Uh, the most expensive thing about SSL is creating the initial connections, connection. That's why uh, we are keeping a five-minute timeout, so once a client connected to our site, we're caching that SSL connection so we don't need to re-establish. If you send a request within the next five minutes again, you can reuse that connection. And by default, it's using 50 megabytes of RAM uh, for keeping that shared connection. Uh, according to the documentation, you can do about 4,000 sessions with one megabyte of RAM. So uh, 50 megabytes of RAM should give you 200,000 connections which is hopefully enough for most sites. So this is the most expensive thing. Doing that, you won't need to re-establish uh, connections once you have had them. And now let's get to the not-so-fun part, uh, the SSL ciphers. So that's the main reason why you should copy the configuration. That's a secure configuration. There you have all the ciphers which are available, and you're also explicitly saying, OK, some we don't allow. So you're both including some and explicitly excluding uh, some unsecured ones. Uh, and you tell that the server decides which SSL certificates uh, and which ciphers are OK to be used. Um, and as you've probably heard, SSL is unsecure, so only TLS, uh, the successor, should be used in general. Uh, and then there is one nice parameter. Uh, you can set the uh, forward for forward secrecy. Does everyone know what forward secrecy is? It's like when you encryption a connection, it's con uh, encrypted on a per connection basis. So even if the NSA uh, connects all the encrypted traffic and gets your key afterwards, it cannot encrypt the data in general, but needs to decrypt uh, every connection on its own. So that's what perfect, uh, perfect forward secrecy is. Nginx enables it by default, so there's nothing to do but it uses a bit of a, a weak key. So to strengthen that, you can enable uh, that parameter and you just generate it with OpenSSL DHParam 2048, and it will generate you a random key that's being used for the uh, one-time encryption for connections. So that's what uh, a secure connection would look like. And to finish off, uh, 
Strict uh, transport security basically tells uh, a client, uh, if you have connected in the past, I set this uh, header, so if you ever try to connect to me again, only use an SSL connection. Never try to use a plain text connection. And we are storing that for six months, so the client keeps uh, a setting during the next six months, only try con to connect to that ho host via SSL. Uh, otherwise, if you would do that in the plain text, First, you could see uh, information transmitting in the first request, uh, and the, you could be open to a man-in-the-middle attack. So if someone would intercept the unencrypted initial connection, they could uh, attack you. But with this setting, once you've had a secure connection during the next six months, all the other connections are, be are secured. And you don't need any explicit redirects. And the last thing is the most... Uh, yeah, obscure, obscure one, uh, the OCSP stapling, which basically is because revoking certificates is totally broken in SSL. So once your certificates have been compromised, uh, you can revoke them. So you can tell, OK, this has been uh, a valid uh, certificate, but uh, someone got the private key, so it's no longer to be trusted. I revoke the certificate. Unfortunately, the browsers don't uh, check for that. And with OCS stapling, you can tell uh, the browser, okay, when you connect to this server, check if this certificate is valid. And we are also caching that information, so uh, because otherwise you could probably do a denial of service attack uh, on on the root certificate, and then the revoc revocation list wouldn't be checked again. So this is the best approach uh, to ensure that the certificates are being checked. Uh, if they have been revoked or not. And that's it basically. So please, I beg you, uh, use the GitHub, uh, the, the, the Mozilla configuration. It's just you can click it together and copy it. And afterwards, uh, SSL Labs uh, provides a free test where you can test if your SSL configuration is free. Always do that because it's really easy to mess it up. Okay. So that was point zero. Oh. Did you get the URL? But you'll get the slides afterwards anyway. Um, OK, so point one, load balancing. Uh, if one server isn't enough and like the, the logs are falling off of the truck, uh, you could use a better load balancing. And this is much more simple, because that's basically the configuration. You say, OK, I have a server now. We don't use SSL. We just listen on port 80. Uh, the domain name is example.com doesn't matter. And all requests going to that uh, domain, so uh, if they go to the root, uh, we use a proxy pass, and that proxy pass is passed on to the backend hosts. And the backend hosts, uh, that's what's defined up here. And we're simply saying, OK, we have three servers, which will get uh, the actual requests. And you can use host names or IP addresses. It just doesn't matter. So. Uh, all the requests coming to your load balancing Nginx instance will then be redirected to your backend hosts. And that will be done in a round robin fashion. So the first request uh, goes to the first server, then the second request to the second, third to the third. The fourth request will go again to the, the first server. And then again, it's always rotating basically around all the available servers. Uh, there are. It's yeah. Give me a second. <laughs> Um, yeah, there are many more things than sticky sessions even. Okay, um, one thing that you commonly need to do is because your backend servers, which actually do your work, uh, need to have some kind of information like the IP address of the client so they know where the client is located and other stuff like that. Uh, for that, you can pass on some proxy information like the host is the original URL the client called. Then the schema is, was it a request via HTTP or HTTPS? Uh, what was the actual IP the client called? Uh, and that's uh, all the IPs that were met during transit to the final server. So that's the client IP, the load balancing IP would be here. Sometimes you just need those information for, yeah, like gear location stuff, uh, or you just need to know what kind of protocol has been used. So you can simply forward those informations. Uh, then for the load balancing, round robin is the default. So it's just taking 
each server one by one, and once it has finished the last one, it starts at the beginning again and, and uses all the others. Uh, there are more settings. You can say least con, so the Nginx load balancer knows, okay, which of the backend servers has the least connections. Probably that's the one who has the least to do, so that should get the next few connections. And it will forward uh, the next connections to, do to the server with the least connections. Uh, alternatively, you can say IP hashing, so you take the first three octets of the IP, hash that, so that will always get the same hash result, uh, and based on that, it will fo be forwarded to the same backend server all the time. Uh, or you can even define your own hash function. So you can have some kind of client attribute, uh, for example, a user ID or a username, and based on that hash information, uh, the backend server will be selected. Uh, and there are many more features, like cookie stickiness, but to keep it simple, I didn't want to show more code. Uh, you can even uh, weight the nodes. So if one of the servers is much more powerful than the others, you could say, okay, that server should get three requests and each, other one, each of the other ones just one in a round robin uh, or in one round robin round. Okay, so next, proxying. Um, proxying is pretty much uh, the same, so you would run a proxy uh, if you have some kind of backend service that's rather slow and is not so good with keeping up many open connections, so you would load offload that to Nginx, which would do the connection keeping for you, uh, or if you have multiple uh, backend services running, and you want to serve all of them on port 80 and 443. So since you cannot run multiple services on those ports, uh, you could use proxying, and you could uh, forward multiple locations to different backend servers. So if you had one server which serves both a Rails application and a Java application, you would stick uh, an Nginx in front of it, and that would just redirect uh, the request to the backend server, and the user wouldn't need to add the not so nice port uh, of the backend service, but would just go directly to the server and get back the right response. And for proxy passing, uh, except for the probably you would need to forward the headers again, uh, otherwise that's just it. Okay, so dynamic pages. It's easy to integrate stuff like PHP, for example. Okay, not the most popular language, uh, but it's also easily done. Uh, in contrast to the good old LAMP stack, where you basically integrate uh, PHP into the Apache server, and then it runs as a CGI module inside the server, uh, Nginx doesn't support that, because it's a bit slower. Uh, Nginx uh, requires that uh, it runs as a, its own service. So you simply tell, if I have a request coming in for something that ends with, with PHP, so it's probably a PHP file, uh, then hand off that request uh, to the process. So you can either do that via uh, an IP and port, or you can just use a Unix socket, which has a little less overhead. So if you run it on the same server, the Nginx process and the fast uh, CGI, you can just use it like that. So the Nginx would forward the PHP script to the PHP interpreter. Uh, and then would generate the result, and then Nginx would uh, send back the final result. And here we are saying, okay, the index page, if you access a directory, is index.php, and you set the read time out of each request ma may last up to 120 seconds, but basically that's it. So you just need a standalone PHP process, and then you can simply access it. Um, one other very nice feature is uh, A-B testing. You don't need any server-side scripting for that. You can actually do that only with Nginx, which looks like that. Very simple again. So we have a server, again, listening on port 80, uh, uh, ex accessing uh, example.com. And then we say, OK, the index page uh, you get is index, then a variable, and then .html. And then we have three different index files for A-B testing. So we have an index file called index.first.html, uh, index.second.html, and index.html. So those are the three files we're A-B testing. And we're then saying, okay, 
based on the IP coming in, that IP is again hashed. So if you're coming from one IP, you will get into, you will always get to the same uh, page. So you won't see any switches. Uh, so 10% of the users get the first A-B test, 10% the second, and everybody else it is just getting the plain uh, .html file. And that's all you need for a simple A-B test. You can then slap on your Google Analytics or whatever and see how the users interact with it. You don't need any fancy server-side scripting. You can simply do it like that. Um, and one more thing. Client-side caching is also very easy. So I think there was an Italian lecture on client-side caching. I w was sitting in there, but I didn't really get it since I don't speak Italian. <laughs> but the slides looked very nice. Uh, and to enable uh, client-side caching in Nginx is very easy as well. So you simply say, OK, those are the file endings. Tho those should be cached on the client basically forever. And if one of these files is accessed, I don't want to see anything in the log. So just to keep avoid any performance overhead on logging, no logging, set it, uh, save it forever, and send it to the client. If you change these files, uh, they won't be reloaded by the client. So it's a good practice then to put a hash of the file in the file name. So if the file changes, it will just have a new file name, and it will then be uh, stored again forever. OK. That was the feature part. Um, you could probably also do that really with 101 uh, features in decimal notation. I stuck with uh, binary um, just because of the time. But I'm sure you could get 101 features out of Nginx. OK, so now let's get to the performance. Um, so there's this saying, a patch is like Microsoft Word. It has a million options, but you only need six. Um, Nginx does those six things and does them, uh, five of them, 50 times faster than Apache. OK, yeah, it's like Word. So generally, yes, that's great. But there's a but. It doesn't work the Apache way. For example, the Apache users got very used to those htaccess files, which are very convenient. You just throw in a file, and then it's picked up automatically. The problem is HD access is really a performance killer because uh, you can put into every directory you could have an HD access file and it would need to be checked at runtime for every directory. Do I have an HD access file? Okay, if there's one, go into it, parse it, then go to the next directory. Is there an HD access file? Uh, parse that. And only then go to the final file, because you could have an, a, a redirect in between, or you could have uh, a basic, uh, HD basic auth, or whatever. Um, the nice thing is the HD access is effective immediately. Uh, Nginx goes a different way. There you have this kind of configuration in the server file. Um, so you need to reload the server, but it doesn't need to check all the directories each time a request comes in. Because assume you have this kind uh, of, the, uh, of structure. You have an image uh, three uh, directories deep, and you have an HD access file in the root folder and in assets. Then you would need to go, OK, is there a file in the root folder HD access? Yes, parse it. Is there one in assets? Yes, parse it. Is there one in uploads? No. Is there one in gallery? No. And only then serve the image. So basically, uh, you have five, five, five file checks versus one in a patch between uh, and Nginx. Uh, and reading files, you would need to read three files versus one, which probably uh, doesn't make a lot of sense for most situations. And yeah, it's always my reaction. It just cannot be a good idea. OK, so I did some benchmarks. Uh, I spun up uh, two DigitalOcean servers, uh, the small instances with half a gigabyte of RAM, 20 gigs of SSD, and put the latest Ubuntu version on then, and tested it in two different zones in Amsterdam, and then ran some benchmarks with Apache Bench, which is just, yeah, I just installed it and then ran the, the test. So I've had basically two servers, one installed with Apache, one with Nginx, and I would just benchmark the other one. And I did 25,000 requests uh, with a concurrency of 
10, 50, 250, and 1,000 connections. So those were the settings I tested. And I just did a vanilla installation, and uh, no configuration changes, no tweaks, uh, just what comes out of the box. Um, unfortunately, the results are a bit unstable, so I ran the test multiple times, and the numbers would change quite a bit, like up to 20 or 30 percent. Um, I don't really know why, because there was nothing else running on these servers, and the, co the network connection should be pretty stable as well. But yeah. So take it with a bit of care. I did the benchmarks. I think they show some direction, uh, but the numbers are not absolute. And if you run the test yourself, you might get slightly different results. OK, so how does it look like? I run here. I'm testing Nginx. I'm running my Apache Bench with 25,000 connections, 10 concurrently against an IP. And I fetched the code motion intro logo 25,000 times. So that's part of the output. That's the relevant part. So I can see it in total it took 7.7 uh, .7 seconds to complete my 25,000 requests. And what I actually measured against each other then wa were the requests per second. So here we have. 3,232 requests uh, served per second, since it's only a static file. It's quite a nice number. OK, so that's what the results look like. Apache is the red one. Nginx is the green one. Uh, the problem was uh, with 10,000 concurrent, uh, with 1,000 concurrent connections, Apache wouldn't finish the test. So that's why it fell down to 1,000. It would. Uh, it would just break at 2, uh, 24,000 requests or something like that, uh, probably because it's not uh, really configured for that. I'm sure you could tweak it somehow to make those requests, but by default, uh, Nginx just does just much better. So if you have a very low concurrency, like 10 requests, which is just a single user, basically, because if you open a website, you're rec generally getting like 10 resources on each request. So that's like only one user concurrently. They are pretty much the same at 3,000 requests per second for a static image now. Uh, but if you've got like three, four, five users concurrently, Nginx can serve your requests faster. And if you've like 50 users or so, uh, Nginx keeps uh, going pretty well uh, and doesn't really die down like Apache. OK. That's what happened uh, with a thousand uh, concurrent connections. It would just say, uh, yeah, socket reset. Sorry, I couldn't handle the requests. Bad luck. Try again later. Um, OK, then I put, because of the HD access, I stuck the image into a, the subdirectory. Just as described before, we had an HD access in the, the root folder and in assets. And I must admit, I was a bit astonished because there wasn't that much of a difference. It's pretty much the same as before. So the HD access actually doesn't make, at least on an SSD, uh, that much of a difference. OK, Apache again doesn't do like 25,000 requests then with 1,000 concurrently. Uh, Nginx does. And it's like, OK, 4,000 against 7,000 or 7,500. So it's not even double. OK. Uh, and then I gave it a try with PHP. Uh, so I used PHP FPM for Nginx and the good old mod CGI uh, on Apache. And I simply requested the file PHP info uh, a few times. So there's nothing fancy in there, no, no big computations, just to see how much difference does it make to fetch a dynamic file instead of a static one. Uh, and I had to lower the requests, otherwise I would still be doing the benchmarks, I guess. Uh, and you have to add a parameter because the, the result is not always exactly the same because I think there's a timestamp or something in there and the result slightly changes. Uh, you need to add that L parameter, otherwise uh, the, you get a bogus report that the pages were not the same and the test couldn't finish. Uh, and here Apache uh, was actually doing pretty well again. So I must admit, I didn't expect that. So just serving uh, the PHP info file, 
there wasn't that much of a difference. The difference was if I tried to do more than 100 concurrent connections, uh, Apache again just wouldn't uh, do anything and would issue non-200 requests, so you would just get some kind of 500 er error page. Okay, so what you should take with you? Build your own application, benchmark it, and repeat that process. Uh, unfortunately, uh, any benchmark someone else does doesn't really cover your use case. So you will probably have some kind of different scenario. Your application will be structured differently. You have a different number of concurrent users. Um, and it's best described in this comic. I hope you can read it. Professor Sapinski proved that the squid is more intelligent than the house cat when posed with puzzles under similar conditions. So even if you try to really do the same thing, you probably won't get the result you would be expecting. Uh, and finally, still say Apache one more time, always use Nginx. OK, any questions? And those who are not answering questions, uh, asking questions, uh, I would love to get some feedback. So questions? Yes? Are there any monitoring tools for Nginx? Yeah, sure. You're Whatever you want to use, basically. It's Do you mean something hosted or something you run on your own? Something hosted like a service, no. or you you will want to use like Monit or something yeah, on your own. Like yeah, yeah, there are monitoring tools. It's pretty well supported both uh, by hosted services uh, as well as the regular tools. So what what would you like? Well, it it depends. It it's just probably an agent running on the same instance. So you don't really need to recompile it. And there's also a very nice module. I've forgotten its name. It will pass your log files. And based on your log files, it will spit out a lot of information. So it will tell you how many requests there were and what your peaks were. And so, so you don't even need to do it at runtime. You can only access the, the logs afterwards, which is probably also very nice. Uh, I can add that to the slides afterwards if you want to. Any other questions? Yes. Absolutely. So, wait. Um, I will just. Where is a simple example? Okay, here we, we say we have a server. It's listening on port 80, and that's the host name. And if you only copy that section and use a different host name, you have another whole, uh, you, it's just a different name. So it's much simpler than the vhost thing you need to do in Apache, which is really a pain in the ass once you've seen that. <laughs> yes? Can I use uh, Nginx and Apache together? Well, how do, on, on which port do you want to run them, or how do you want to use them? I mean, sure you can, but I don't really see the point because basically everything you can do in uh, Apache, you can probably do in Nginx, unless you have some very funky module. Oh, you mean Tomcat, not HTTPD. Okay, yeah, for Tomcat, sure. For, oops, no, wh where was my proxying slide? Yeah. For Tomcatcher, do, do that. And it's not port 8000, but I've forgotten the default. 8080 probably is the default port for Tomcat. So you can simply surf. And you can surf your static resources via Nginx, which is much faster doing that. And only do the dynamic Java requests with Tomcat. That will also save a lot of overhead. Uh, you can surf the static resources like uh, your images, your CSS files, and stuff like that. You could surf that with Nginx directly without putting that requirement on Tomcat, and Tomcat would only surf your dynamic Java pages. And because the, the overhead for connections on Tomcat and stuff uh, is very or is much higher. Uh, 
Sure, if you, if you uh, are a Java guy, that we are also doing that, yes. Yes, we are, we are totally doing that for load balancing, and we can also, you can also define then error pages on Nginx, so if your Apache uh, Tomcat instance is not available, uh, the Nginx will still display some kind of 500 page, even if you have stopped the Tomcat server while you are deploying or something like that. <coughs> so yeah, there's, there are some pretty good things you can do with that. And there's good documentation on that as well. Yes? Would you use uh, uh, Nginx or Varnish for page caching? Uh, I didn't do any benchmarks. I'm not entirely sure. It's I guess they can both serve your requirements, but it will always depend. I'm yeah, we can discuss it afterwards, but I'm no, no official answer. <laughs> yes? Maybe it's a stupid question, but you are saying that like, for static content, we can use Nginx. But what is static? Now, you always have at least at the header some panel where it's written if the user is logged, it's written high user. Okay, but aren't your images and CSS files the same for everyone? Okay, only those, I mean, with static. So not any HTML files or so, uh, but the just images and CSS files, probably you don't need to... Dis oh, okay, so by static you mean images and this? Exactly, like you would put them on the CDN, a content delivery network, you could also serve it on your own okay. Nginx instance. Uh, Right, but you could have a static HTML landing page where you have your login and everything like that. Okay. But the form is then processed by something else. Uh, right. So that, and you would have a very fast initial load, right. which is also nice. nice. <coughs> More questions? Yes? Is it possible to use for server-side For server-side I don't think so, or at least we are not doing it that way. We, as, at least we are always caching then in memcached or something like that. So what would you cache in Nginx? You mean in memory? Yeah. It's not really an in-memory cache. Like you're still using Redis, memcached, whatever for that. More questions? Everyone happy? Okay, thanks, have a good day.